The 8,137th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is non-proliferation, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The agenda is adopted. I wish to warmly welcome the Secretary General, ministers, and other distinguished representatives present in the Security Council Chamber. Your presence underscores the importance of the subject matter we'll discuss today. In accordance with the Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of the Procedure, I invite a representative of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome His Excellency Mr. Cho Hyun, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Republic of Korea. The, Secre the Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw attention of the Council members to document S-2017-1038, a letter dated 1st of December 2017 from the Permanent Representative of Japan to the United Nations addressed to the Secretary General, transmitting a concept paper on the item under consideration. I now give the floor to the Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, allow me to first thank Japan and thank you personally for convening this meeting. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome the many ministers and other representatives around this table, as well as the participation of the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in this important meeting. The situation on the Korean Peninsula is the most tense and dangerous peace and security issue in the world today. I'm deeply concerned by the risk of military confrontation, including as a result of unintended escalation or miscalculation. I know that the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs briefed the Security Council earlier this week on his recent visit to the DPRK. I will not repeat what he said but I want to note it was the first in-depth political exchange of views between the United Nations Secretariat and officials in Pyongyang in almost eight years. And his visit came indeed at the end of a difficult period. In 2017, the DPRK conducted activities related to its nuclear and ballistic missile programs at an alarming and accelerated pace. On September the 3rd, it concluded its six nuclear explosive tests involved what its claim was, and I quote, a two-stage thermonuclear weapon, end of quote. This test caused a seismic event of magnitude 6.1. Over the year, the DPRK conducted 20 ballistic missile launches. This has included its first tests of two intercontinental range ballistic missiles, as well as tests of new medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. In September, two Wasong-12 intermediate range ballistic missiles overflew Japan. No aviation or maritime safety notifications were given for any of these launches. The International Atomic Energy Agency remains unable to access the DPRK to verify the status of its nuclear program. The agency monitors developments through satellite imagery. At the Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center, it has observed signatures consistent with the operation of the plutonium production reactor and reported centrifuge enrichment facility. The agency also continues to observe indications of ongoing mining, milling, and concentration activities at the Pyongsan uranium mine 
and Pyongsan uranium concentration plant. The DPRK remains the only country to continue to break the norm against nuclear testing. Its actions show blatant disregard for the will and resolutions of the Security Council and undermine the international norm against nuclear testing and the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Security Council Resolution 2375, adopted in September, includes the strongest sanctions ever imposed on the DPRK. I reiterate my call on the DPRK leadership to comply with the relevant Security Council resolutions and allow space for the resumption of dialogue on denuclearization and sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. While all concerned seek to avoid an accidental escalation leading to conflict, the risk is being multiplied by misplaced overconfidence, dangerous narratives and rhetoric, and the lack of communication channels. It is time to reestablish and strengthen communication channels, including inter-Korean and military to military channels. This is critical to lower the risk of miscalculation or misunderstanding and reduce tensions in the region. Any military action could have devastated and unpredictable consequences. The unity of the Security Council is an essential instrument to achieve the goal of denuclearization and creates the space for diplomatic initiatives aimed at achieving it in a peaceful manner. The Security Council's call in Resolution 2375 is united, and I quote, to further work to reduce tensions so as to advance the prospects for a comprehensive settlement. And then, expressing its desire for a peaceful and diplomatic solution to the situation, and I go on quoting, welcoming efforts by Council members as well as other member states to facilitate a peaceful and comprehensive solutions through dialogue. The Secretariat and I are your partner in this effort, and my good offices remain always available. I believe the United Nations Secretariat adds strategic value in three key areas. First, impartiality. Second, the voice and norms, values, and principles for peaceful and diplomatic solutions in line with international law, and third, offering channels of communication with all parties. The organization is a key venue where all six parties are represented and can interact to narrow differences in understanding and promote confidence-building measures. As Secretary General, I commit to protecting and strengthening these three areas. Security Council unity behind this effort is essential. Mr. President, I welcome the Council's humanitarian and human rights concerns. The Secretariat has consistently conveyed the importance of disassociating the peace and security situation from humanitarian imperatives. 70% of the population of the DPRK is categorized as food insecure and 40% are malnourished. The 2017 DPRK Humanitarian Needs and Priorities document calls for 114 million US dollars to meet urgent requirements. This is only 30% funded. I ask all member states, particularly those around this table, to carefully consider the humanitarian principles that underpin our work. The people of the DPRK need generosity and help. Mr. President, Excellencies, not long from now, athletes will gather in Pyeongchang for the Winter Olympics. I express my sincerest hope that the DPRK will take part. As the General Assembly has recognized, these games can foster an atmosphere of peace, development, tolerance and understanding on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. We need to spread and deepen that spirit of hope and possibility. Diplomatic engagement is the only pathway to sustainable peace and denuclearization. We must do everything we can to reach that objective and avoid the level of danger that would be unpredictable in its trajectory and catastrophic in its consequences. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing. <clears throat>
I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan. As we have all witnessed, North Korea has been escalating its outrageous acts of provocation in flagrant violation of relevant Security Council resolutions. In the past two years, North Korea has launched 40 ballistic missiles and two of those missiles flew over Japan. They have also conducted three nuclear tests. The one in September, North Korea purported it to be a hydrogen bomb test. Its scale was far larger than its previous test. The, their defiance of the authority of this council is totally unacceptable. Most recently, on November 29th, North Korea launched a ballistic missile with a range of an ICBM. This appears to be a new type. It demonstrated once again that North Korea poses a clear global threat to all member states. The advancement of its nuclear program fundamentally threatens NPT regime. The latest, latest launch was conducted 75 days after North Korea's provocations in September. Some optimistic views labeled these 75 days of silence as a positive signal. However, the missile launch in November made it clear that North Korea was continuing to relentlessly develop its nuclear and missile programs, even while they were seemingly silent. It is ever more evident that North Korea is nowhere near ready to abandon them, nor is it interested in returning to a meaningful dialogue. The visit by United Nations Under Secretary General Feltman only reconfirmed the dire reality. The international community should be even more alarmed by the fact that North Korea is continuing its nuclear and missile development even as we hold this meeting. North Korea purports that its programs are for its own security, including maintenance of its regime. Quite to the contrary, it is an extremely dangerous act which goes against the international order and could affect the safety of any other member state. In this connection, Japan has never set its goal as a regime change in other countries or regions by force. We are of the view that a peaceful solution is desirable. However, it is North Korea that has consistently rejected such a solution. Instead, it has been continuously escalating its act of provocation. North Korea is ignoring the so-called agreed framework of 1994 and the joint statement of the six-party talks of 2005. In betrayal of the good faith of all the countries concerned, North Korea used these talks as pretext to continue its nuclear and missile development. Over these two decades, how has North Korea rewarded our efforts towards dialogue and assistance? North Korea employed brinkmanship and tried to win concessions. It is our responsibility not to repeat such past mistakes as conducting dialogue for the sake of dialogue. It has only served North Korea to stall for time on its nuclear and missile development. Relevant Security Council resolution have already clearly decided that North Korea must abandon its programs in a complete, verifiable, and irreversible manner. We should not backtrack from that goal. A prerequisite for a meaningful dialogue is North Korea's commitment and concrete action toward denuclearization. What is important today is that the international community becomes more united and cooperate closely on maximize pressure on North Korea by all means available. 
Only by doing so, we can make North Korea change its policy. The series of United Nations sanction measures are an effective means to achieve this goal. In this regard, this Council should also be reminded of its determination expressed in relevant resolution to take further significant measures in the event of a further nuclear test or launch by North Korea. Sanctions are a tool to make North Korea understand that there is no other way but to change its policy. The Security Council has adopted unprecedentedly strong sanction measures, which are close to a full-fledged sanction regime. Sanctions are most effective when they are fully implemented. They must exert robust pressure on North Korea and curb their nuclear and missile programs by drastically reducing its foreign currency earnings. In this context, we strongly urge all member states to fully implement the sanctions and close any possible loopholes. To this end, Japan is ready to assist countries which have difficulties in implementing sanction measures. In addition, we welcome more autonomous measures targeting North Korea being introduced or reinforced in many countries. Japan calls on all member states to take further additional measures to stop the movement of persons, goods, funds to North Korea, including severing diplomatic ties. Japan has been implementing its own strict measures. Today, I would like to announce in this Council that Japan has just introduced additional autonomous measures. We have newly designated 19 North Korean entities for asset freeze. I also call on other member states to take similar measures. Regrettably, the threat posed by North Korea also includes production capacity of other weapons of mass destruction, such as biological and chemical weapons. It also includes activities in the cyberspace. It is reported that North Korea may be acquiring funds to further develop its nuclear and missile programs by selling weapons or through cyber theft. We should strengthen our international network of information sharing and cooperation so that we can better cope with all possible threats. Even as we speak, nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles are being steadily developed at the expense of the welfare of the people in North Korea. Grave violations of their human rights cannot be overlooked. In the past, North Korean agents infiltrated Japan and abducted a number of Japanese citizens, including a girl as young as 13 years old. Only five of the abductees returned. Many abducted Japanese have remained in custody in North Korea. This week, a mother of one of the abductees passed away, not having seen her beloved daughter for nearly 40 years. Another family member also passed away recently. The families cannot wait forever. It is most regrettable that only a few of the abductees have returned to their home country where their families and friends are waiting. We need to underscore our serious concern over human rights violation and abuses committed by North Korea including those against citizens of other countries within and outside the territory of North Korea, as seen in the case of Mr. Warmbier of the United States. The comprehensive resolution of the abduction issues and the nuclear and the missile issues is the only way to realize the goal of the United Nations to maintain international peace and security including North Korea itself. North Korea may be able to dramatically boost its economy and improve the welfare of its people if it chooses the right path. 
North Korea will only be able to enjoy a bright future by resolving the nuclear and missile issues and abduction cases. As North Korea has yet to fulfill its commitment to denuclearization and make concrete actions towards that end, let us send a clear and unified message together here that the international community will never accept nuclear armed North Korea. Thank you. I now resume my function as the President of the Council. I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State of the United States of America. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. On behalf of the United States, I thank Japan and Foreign Minister Kono for convening this ministerial session on the growing threat from North Korea. Upon taking office, President Trump identified North Korea as the United States' greatest national security threat. That judgment remains the same today. After its ICBM launch on November the 29th, the North Korean government claimed that it now possessed the capability to strike any location in the continental United States. North Korea's growing capabilities reflect a direct threat to our security and the security of the entire world. We do not regard this claim as an empty threat. North Korean regimes continuing unlawful missile launches and testing activities signal its contempt for the United States, its neighbors in Asia, and all members of the United Nations. In face of such a threat, inaction is unacceptable for any nation. Through a series of robust Security Council resolutions, this body has taken a leading role in condemning North Korea's unlawful nuclear and missile programs and imposing consequences. The international community remains firm in our determination that we will not accept a nuclear North Korea. Each UN member state must fully implement all existing UN Security Council resolutions. For those nations who have not done so or who have been slow to enforce Security Council resolutions, your hesitation calls into questions whether your vote is a commitment to words only, but not actions. For countries who have not taken action, I urge you to consider your interest, your allegiances, and your values in the face of this grave and global threat. We believe that more can and must be done beyond enforcing the minimum requirements of the Security Council resolutions directed at the DPRK. Last spring, the United States initiated a peaceful pressure campaign of economic and diplomatic sanctions against North Korea with the intent of setting conditions for North Korea to engage in serious negotiations toward the complete, verifiable, and irreversible abandonment of its nuclear weapons programs. Our resolve to continue this campaign is even greater today. Over the past year, many allies and partners of the United States have joined our campaign, going beyond mere compliance with the Security Council resolutions. We ask these nations to continue to increase pressure through unilateral action. Doing so will further isolate North Korea politically and economically, cutting off support and funds for its unlawful nuclear and missile programs. We particularly call on Russia and China to increase pressure, including going beyond full implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions. Continuing to allow North Korean laborers to toil in slave-like conditions inside Russia in exchange for wages used to fund nuclear weapons programs calls into question Russia's dedication as a partner for peace. Similarly, as Chinese crude oil flows to North Korean refineries, the United States questions China's commitment to solving an issue that has serious implications for the security of its own citizens. Recently, the North Korean regime has sought to portray UN sanctions as harmful to women and children. But this is a regime that hypocritically spends billions on nuclear and ballistic missile programs while its own people suffer great poverty. The regime could feed and care for women, children, and ordinary people of North Korea if it chose the welfare of its people over weapons development. The DPRK has a choice. It can reverse course, give up its unlawful nuclear weapons program, and join the community of nations. 
or it can continue to condemn its people to poverty and isolation. The regime in Pyongyang bears the ultimate responsibility for the well-being of its people. North Korea claims to undertake its nuclear weapons program as an essential step for the survival of its regime. In making this choice, North Korea has made itself less secure, and its economy has become further isolated and disconnected from the global economy. We have been clear that all options remain on the table in the defense of our nation. But we do not seek, nor do we want, war with North Korea. The United States will use all necessary measures to defend itself against North Korean aggression, but our hope remains that diplomacy will produce a resolution. As I said earlier this week, a sustained cessation of North Korea's threatening behavior must occur before talks can begin. North Korea must earn its way back to the table. The pressure campaign must and will continue until denuclearization is achieved. We will, in the meantime, keep our channels of communication open. Our message today is one that this body has heard before and one that we will continue to repeat. The United States will not allow the regime in Pyongyang to hold the world hostage. We will continue to hold North Korea accountable for its reckless and threatening behavior today and in the future. We ask every nation here to join us in exerting sovereignty to protect all of our people. We ask all to join a unified effort to achieve a complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Tillerson for his statement. I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Margot Wallström, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is the greatest threat to international peace and security facing the world today. And the Democratic People's Republic of Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile program illustrates, as you've already heard, a blatant disregard for its international obligations. And the DPRK has repeatedly violated international law, including numerous Security Council resolutions. Its actions are also contrary to the existing global norm against nuclear testing, embodied in the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and global non-proliferation norms. This Council has repeatedly, and I think this uh, is the 16th uh, meeting, has repeatedly been called together this year to address the illegal testing of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles by the DPRK. At each meeting, Council members have unanimously condemned these provocations in the strongest terms. The world does not accept DPRK's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs, and it is essential that we continue to stand united. Mr. President, I would like to thank you for convening today's important meeting. And I particularly welcome the presence of the representative of the Republic of Korea and the DPRK here today, and let this meeting be a step towards uh, dialogue. I want to take this opportunity to convey directly to you the following five messages to the DPRK. First, cease all provocations. Second, engage in a credible and meaningful dialogue. Third, Abide by the Security Council's resolutions and fulfill your international obligations. Fourth, abandon your nuclear weapons and missile program in a complete, verifiable and irreversible manner. And fifth, return to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the IAEA safeguards. Mr. President, the adoption of Resolution 2375 earlier this year toughened the targeted sanctions against the DPRK, and it now constitutes the most rigorous sanctions regime ever enforced under the United Nations system. For these sanctions to have desired effects, it is critical that we urgently ensure their universal and comprehensive implementation. And to this end, we need additional capacity at all levels, uh, including improved uh, monitoring and targeted capacity building. 
We are actively engaged uh, through the European Union in support of such efforts. This week, the Council has held discussions on both the acute human rights situation and the precarious humanitarian conditions in the DPRK. The humanitarian situation for ordinary North Koreans remains of serious concern. The responsibility for the well-being of the North Korean people falls without doubt on the government of the DPRK. At the same time, it is of utmost importance that the humanitarian exemptions provided for under the sanctions regime are upheld. Reports that international humanitarian organizations' ability to provide assistance has been reduced, therefore, need to be addressed. As the Secretary General has pointed out, there is also an urgent need for more funding towards life-saving humanitarian assistance in the DPRK. Mr. President, over the last year, tensions on the Korean, Korean Peninsula have continued to rise, and they have now reached a very dangerous level. And I think we all want to install a sense of urgency on this matter. Provocations have been accompanied by an increase in confrontational rhetoric. In this environment, the potential for mistakes, misunderstandings, and miscalculations is high. In parallel to effectively implementing the sanctions regime, we must undertake further work to reduce tensions in order to advance the prospects for a comprehensive settlement. Sanctions alone will not resolve the current situation. Intensified and creative diplomatic efforts that pave the way for a peaceful diplomatic and political solution are urgently needed. The situation must be approached without prejudice, and we must be prepared to consider both new and previous proposals and agreements. In this regard, there is also a need to explore the possibilities for regional security cooperation and arrangements. Sweden is contributing to these diplomatic efforts, and we welcome Under Secretary General Feldman's recent visit to the DPRK. Mr. President, this Council has the responsibility to uphold peace and security. All over the world, people are now, they have their eyes on what happens here, and they fear what could be the result of further escalation of the crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Peninsula. We have to exhaust every avenue for diplomacy and dialogue. Efforts are urgent, and the consequences of failure would be disastrous. Thank you. I thank Her Excellency Ms. Molstrom for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Pablo Klimkin, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Uh, good morning, everyone. I thank the Japanese Presidency and you personally, Minister Kona, for convening today's briefing. And, of course, I also thank the Secretary General for his uh, very useful update. The ongoing development of nuclear and missile program of North Korea continues to undermine the global disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Recent developments proved that Pyongyang is arrogantly defiant in ignoring international law and repeated calls to halt its illegal activity. Unprecedented provocative actions by North Korea in the last two years were met by the most robust sanctions regime in history. Resolution 2375, adopted unanimously in response to the six and the most powerful nuclear test conducted by DPRK, sent very clear signals to Pyongyang. In particular, it urged Pyongyang not to conduct any further missile launches or nuclear tests and refrain from any other provocations. At the same time, the Council indicated the way out of the crisis, including by reaffirming its commitment to a peaceful, diplomatic, and political solution to the situation, confirming DPRK's sovereignty and stressing the need for further work to reduce tensions, to advance the prospects for a comprehensive settlement. What was the response to this resolution? Another missile test. So despite all political and diplomatic efforts to curb Pyongyang's aggressive ambitions, 
North Korea moved closer to having a fully functional nuclear arsenal. The increase in militarization has already severely affected the livelihoods of its people, who continue to live under a constant duress, experiencing chronic shortages of even basic goods and services. Besides diverting resources from acute human needs to finance its missile and nuclear program, DPAK continues to effectively evade sanctions. Recent developments, in particular the ICBM launch last month, suggest that Pyongyang is not interested in resumption of negotiations. We are of the view that is shared by many around this table that only a full implementation of the Security Council resolutions can bring us closer to changing this trend. Before it happens, the Council must stand ready to introduce additional measures in case of new provocations. The long-standing crisis on the Korean Peninsula has global implications and thus raises a question as to what should be done by international community to prevent emergence of a nuclear threat in the future in other parts of the globe as well. In my view, the case of North Korea contains uh, basically two important lessons for the international community. First, it demonstrates what may happen when weapons of mass destruction are obtained by irresponsible actors. Today, Pyongyang blackmails the entire region and actually the entire world, threatening to use its nuclear and missile capabilities without any sort of possible consequences and repercussions. Thus, we continue to witness emerging and further evolving challenges to uh, the non-proliferation regime. Unfortunately, it's becoming harder for this Council to respond in unity. More often, we witness the policy of unwillingness of some countries to recognize that the North Korean regime represents a fundamental threat. Those who are looking for excuses for Pyongyang should realize that for people in Japan, Republic of Korea, and other countries, North Korean missile alerts have become a fact of life. Just imagine how it, uh, how it feels to be jolted awake by the wail of Syrians piercing the early morning come. This brings me to the second lesson. Appeasement of aggressive ambition never works. Furthermore, Perpetrators are only encouraged by concessions and inactions by the international community. We have already witnessed it in the 30s and see this today in Europe and elsewhere. Therefore, the international community should demonstrate a clear and uncompromised, I would like to reiterate it, uncompromised stance in defending international law wherever or by whomever is breached. This stance should not be limited to declarations on ultimate necessity to defend human rights, peace, and security. We need actions, prompt, and adequate responses. In recent decades, we have witnessed the emergence of a number of volatile hotspots in different parts of the world. We have also seen a nuclear weapon state successfully testing a technology of creating long-standing destabilization and carrying out aggression against its neighbors, sovereign states. Unfortunately, my country has been affected too. Early this month, we marked the 23rd anniversary of the signing of the Budapest Memorandum on security assurance in connection with Ukraine accession to the NPT. In return to voluntary renunciation by Ukraine of its nuclear arsenal, the three nuclear states committed to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine. The signatories of the memorandum further obliged to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine, and that none of the weapons will ever be used against Ukraine. Let me remind this Council that the provision of security guarantees to Ukraine by nuclear states was a precondition for my country's accession to the NPT. And let me also stress 
that this memorandum is registered with the UN Secretariat in accordance with the Article 102 of the Charter and certified by the Secretary General as an international agreement. However, the obligations set forth in this document were insidiously violated by Russia, one of the signatories and the recipient of the nuclear weapons based in Ukraine until 1994. As a result, my country got fundamental violation of its borders in a blatant show of disregard for norms and principles of international law, Charter of the United Nations, Helsinki Final Act, and a number of other agreements, including the Budapest Memorandum. The illegal occupation of Crimea and the ongoing Russian aggression in Donbas, region of Ukraine, have left the low rich uranium research reactor in Sevastopol, two nuclear repositories, and more than 1,200 radionuclide sources without due control of the Ukrainian national regulator. I wish to remind that the legal framework of uh, IAWA safeguards application in Ukraine, including the autonomy of Sevastopol. And when we speak about the importance of preserving and strengthening the nuclear non-proliferation regime, we should also keep in mind that the continuing occupation of the territory of Ukraine by a nuclear weapon state has resulted in de facto expansion of the geographical area of nuclear weapons deployment. The Russian military aggression against Ukraine, as well as systematic provocation by its client North Korea, have provoked dangerous misbalance in the existing international security system, undermined the effectiveness and reliability of non-proliferation regime. And in order to prevent the world from sliding into the state of lawlessness, we must stand united to ensure respect for international law. We must stand united to ensure responsibility for its violation, no matter whether it was violated by recognized nuclear weapon state or those unfortunately desperately wishing to gain such a status. And it's not going to happen. I thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Klimkin for his statement. And I'll give floor to His Excellency Mr. Mark Field, Minister of State for Asia and the Pacific of the United Kingdom of the Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Foreign Minister, for bringing us together for this important meeting under the Japanese Presidency of the Security Council. And thank you, too, for the Secretary-General Gutierrez for your comprehensive briefing on the clear global threats and the challenges that the destabilizing conduct of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea present to us all. I should like to start uh, by discussing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It was... It is a great diplomatic achievement and remains the cornerstone of our international security. As signatories, we have all benefited from its protections. It is our collective responsibility and it is in our collective interests to ensure that all nations stand by their commitments and obligations under the treaty and its associated agreements. It is also our duty as members of this council and as responsible international actors. We must abide by our collective rules. We must defend our values and we must work together in this Council to safeguard a system of international security that benefit, benefits the whole of humanity. North Korea repeatedly and willfully rebuffs these systems and our collective values. Earlier this week, members of the Council heard appalling and harrowing accounts of the regime's brutal treatment of its own people, of women forced to drown their newborn babies as the regime didn't consider themselves to be racially pure. They heard multiple examples of violations of foreign citizens' rights, including, of course, Mr. President, of those of your own country, Japan. Today, we meet yet again to condemn North Korea's illegal and dangerous nuclear weapons program. Kim Jong-un claims that he wants to be a responsible actor and that he wishes to bring security and prosperity to his people. The regime's actions, exemplified by their systematic violation of human rights and their nuclear weapons program, demonstrate precisely the opposite intent. 
North Korea's pursuit of an inter inter uh, continental nuclear weapon is increasingly destabilizing for us all. North Korea has fired some 20 ballistic missiles this year. We've seen three intercontinental ballistic missile launches and two missile launched across and over the territory of northern Japan. Now, in response to these actions, the Council has unanimously and appropriately decided to impose the strictest sanctions in a generation upon North Korea. Our community of nations has shown its deep condemnation of the regime by taking these sanctions seriously. This has, of course, started to have an impact. We all have the responsibility of ensuring that these sanctions are fully and properly implemented so that they have the desired effect. Now that North Korea's arms dealers are discovering that their usual routes to clients are closed, so their diplomats are struggling to process bank transactions for contraband goods, their exporters of manual labor are finding their contracts are not being renewed. So we must not just keep this pressure up, but we must increase it. We must share information and expertise to prevent North Korea from using front companies or illicit channels to evade sanctions. We must all cooperate fully with the UN's highly competent and professional panel of experts on North Korea's sanctions, and we strongly commend their work and will continue actively to support them. But we should be clear that the reason we enforce sanctions is to force Kim Jong-un to see that he has a choice of two paths. His current path will lead his country to greater poverty and isolation and threatens not just North Korea's but the global security. He can, he must choose to change course. He can choose to comply with the UN Security Council resolutions and to join the community of law-abiding nations. He can choose to let his people express themselves through debate and commerce. This is the real path to security and prosperity for the North Korean people. Only Kim can now make this choice, and we must all work together here to persuade him to make the right choice. So our message to Kim Jong-un and his regime must be clear and united. For the well-being of your countrymen and the safety of your neighbors in the wider world, you must change course. And I hope that the North Korean representative here today conveys these strong messages back to Pyongyang. Mr. President, we must all work together and use all the diplomatic and economic tools at our disposal to deliver this uncompromising message. Let us stand firm. Let us stand fast to our values. The world looks to all of us here to defend our system of international security. For the sake of future generations of humankind, we must now rise to this challenge. I thank His Excellency Mr. Field for his statement. And I will give floor to the representative of Egypt. Mr. President. Egypt continues to reiterate its strong condemnation of the DPRK's activities of nuclear armament, development and launching of ballistic missiles in violation of relevant Security Council resolutions in a manner that threatens international and regional peace and security. This is based on Egypt's constant commitment to the need to preserve the credibility of the NPT regime and the credibility of the Security Council. Egypt also reiterates the need for all UN organs, international organizations, and the international community to decisively address any threat to the nuclear weapons non-proliferation regime without discrimination or double standards. It is a given that Egypt accords importance to the need for all parties to respect binding international consensus given that the NPT is one of the most important pillars of the existing security regime. 
there is also a need for the Security Council to deal with any threat to this regime and with any measures that stand in the way of its universalization in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner. Egypt is also cognizant that the repeated violations of the DPRK by the DPRK of the, Inter the Security Council resolutions, they constitute a threat to peace and security and the stability of Northeast Asia and the national security of friendly countries, namely Japan and the Republic of Korea. Therefore, Egypt continues to call on the DPRK to immediately seize any violations and measures that contravene Security Council resolutions. And we call on the DPRK to abstain from any escalation that would lead to further tension and instability in a manner that threatens international and regional peace and security. We call on the DPRK to go back to acceding to the NPT as a non-nuclear state and to implement the IAEA safeguards regime without delay. Mr. President, Egypt reiterates the need for the Security Council and all UN organs to bear their responsibilities in this respect through finding a sustainable, peaceful settlement of the troubling situation in the Korean Peninsula. This settlement should provide for total elimination of nuclear weapons and reaching sustainable peace between the two Koreas in accordance with the provisions of the Security Council resolutions. This includes endeavors to revive negotiations and providing a favorable environment to this end so that we can exit this vicious circle of continued violations by the DPRK of the Security Council resolutions. At a time, the Security Council only imposes additional sanctions without a clear political prospect for the solution of the crisis. This only leads to more deterioration that would lead to a real international catastrophe. In this respect, Egypt has followed with interest the visit recently paid by Mr. Jeffrey Feldman, the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs to Pyongyang this month. This is the first of its kind by a high-level UN official since 2010. We consider that continuing engagement and dialogue with the DPRK is an imperative to maintain chances for reviving negotiations and dialogue as a way to reach a peaceful solution to this serious crisis that has a bearing on our, our security at large. In this respect, I would like to thank Mr. Feldman for his briefing on the 12th of December on the outcome of his visit. We underscore the need for continuing engagement and dialogue and not to lose hope in the ability of the international community to reach a peaceful settlement that meets the, the agreed upon provisions in the Security Council resolutions with regard to nuclear disarmament and bringing sustainable peace in the Korean Peninsula. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Egypt for his statement. And I'll give floor to the representative of China. Mr. President, China would like to thank Secretary General Guterres for his briefing. China firmly opposes the development by the DPRK of its nuclear and missile programs in violation of the Security Council resolutions and urges the DPRK to abide by the relevant resolutions of the Security Council. Since the beginning of this year, the situation on the Korean Peninsula has been one of constant tension, while the DPRK continued to conduct nuclear tests and missile launching in defiance of the universal opposition by the international community, the parties concerned kept expanding military exercises and scaling up show of force. Escalation of tension on the Korean Peninsula to the point of risking spiraling out of control is not in any party's interest. Mr. President, 
The nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula has lasted for over two decades with deep historical causes and grave and complex current context. Reviewing the evolution of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula, we can see that when the parties concerned moved towards each other and respected each other's concerns, it was possible to achieve results, whereas when the parties took tough stances and disregarded the security of the other side, it would lead to the deterioration of the situation. The current situation on the Korean Peninsula is mired in the vicious circle of tough posturing and confrontation, which hardly makes one optimistic about its future. However, the hope for peace is not totally obliterated. There is still a possibility for negotiation, and the option of use of force is unacceptable. China believes that all parties concerned should keep in mind the big picture of maintaining peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, judge the situation calmly, make wise choices, and take practical actions. First, it is necessary to put an immediate, immediate end to rhetoric and actions that are unfavorable to denuclearization as well as peace and security of the Korean Peninsula and ease the situation as soon as possible. The tough positions taken by the parties concerned can only escalate tension, deepen division, and increase mutual trust, and therefore are not helpful to the security of all parties. The parties concerned should keep calm and exercise restraint to prevent the situation on the Korean Peninsula from worsening and getting out of control, and create necessary conditions for turning the situation around. Secondly, it is necessary to act in accordance with the provisions and spirit of the Security Council resolutions on the DPRK and push for an appropriate settlement of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula. Since last year, the Council has adopted unanimously a series of resolutions on the DPRK. These resolutions represent the common will of the international community and constitute international obligations that must be observed by all parties. All parties must implement the Council resolutions on the DPRK comprehensively and in their entirety, strengthen non-proliferation measures to curb the DPRK's nuclear and missile programs, and also actively push for a peaceful settlement through diplomatic and political means. At the same time, there is a need to avoid negative impact on the livelihood of the people of the DPRK and the humanitarian assistance activities in the country. Unilateral sanction measures without the authorization of the Security Council undermine the unity of the Council and hurt the legitimate rights and interests of other countries and should therefore be abandoned. Thirdly, it is necessary for all sides to shoulder their due responsibilities and fulfill their own obligations in earnest. The current situation on the peninsula is not caused by any one party alone. And it is not helpful to impose on any one party the responsibility of resolving the problem. The parties concerned should move towards each other instead of engaging in mutual blaming. Still less should they try to shift their responsibilities to others. The U.S. has committed to not seeking regime change, not pursuing the overthrow of the DPRK's government, not accelerating the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, and not moving its troops beyond the 38th parallel. We hope that the U.S. will turn these four commitments into concrete actions. Fourthly, it is necessary to remain committed to peaceful settlement and resume dialogue and negotiations as soon as possible. The core of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula is security. So the fundamental solution lies in addressing in a balanced way the security concerns of all parties, including the DPRK. There is no military option when it comes to the settlement of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula, and resort to force can only bring disastrous consequences to the peninsula. Sanctions are means, not the end. History shows that dialogue and negotiations are the fundamental way to ease tension and advance denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. The parties concerned should endeavor to turn the pressure of sanctions into the driving force for the resumption of dialogue and negotiations and pull the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula back to the right track of peaceful settlement through dialogue and negotiations at an early date. Mr. President. As a close neighbor of the Korean Peninsula, China has persisted in promoting denuclearization of the peninsula, maintaining peace and stability on the peninsula, 
and seeking a settlement through dialogue and negotiations. China is opposed to conflicts and chaos on the Korean Peninsula. China has always supported and implemented comprehensively and strictly the Security Council resolutions on the DPRK. In so doing, China has made greater efforts and paid a higher price than anyone else. It is irresponsible to doubt or challenge what China has done. In view of the current situation on the peninsula, China has put forward the suspension for suspension proposal, namely suspension by the DPRK of nuclear and missile activities and suspension by the U.S. and the ROK of large-scale military exercises. We have proposed the dual-track approach of promoting parallel progress in denuclearization and the establishment of a peace mechanism on the peninsula. The Russian Federation has also put forward the idea of a phased approach to the settlement of the issues of the Korean Peninsula. On the basis of the above proposals, China and the Russian Federation issued a joint statement on July 4th this year proposing a roadmap for the settlement of the Korean Peninsula's problems. The joint proposals of China and Russia are practical and feasible and are aimed at promoting the peaceful settlement of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula and maintaining the peace and stability on the peninsula. As such, we hope they will elicit response and support from the parties concerned. Mr. President, due to historical reasons, the Korean Peninsula is still in the shadow of the Cold War. This is the root cause for the protraction and lack of settlement of the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula. The parties concerned need to reject Cold War thinking in all its forms, establish a concept of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, and seek a peaceful settlement of the Korean nuclear issue through political and diplomatic means so as to realize at an early date denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and long-term security and tranquility of the Northeast Asia for the benefit of the people of the countries in the region. China stands ready to work together with the parties concerned and the international community to continue to play a positive and constructive role for the realization of this goal. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for his statement. I, give now, I now give floor to representative of France. Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers. I would like to thank the Japanese presidency for having convened this important meeting. And I would also like to thank the Secretary General for his very elucidating briefing. Mr. President, France is deeply concerned at the worsening situation on the Korean Peninsula and by the significant risks that arise for our collective security. This year, the North Korean regime fired 20 ballistic missiles, three of them intercontinental, and carried out a nuclear test on an unprecedented scale. And we have met 17 times, 12 of those times, on an emergency basis. North Korea today is an existential threat for our partners in the region. And I would like to assure them of our complete, total solidarity in the face of this unacceptable situation. This unprecedented accumulation of illicit action, which is increasingly destabilizing, has all the hallmarks of a dangerous escalation. The risk is not... The risk is real and proven and has already reached an elevated and increasing level. This is why inaction and weakness are not options. So for France, our action should be guided by three priorities. The first of these priorities is to show ourselves clear-sighted in the face of the extreme seriousness of the situation. The multifaceted progress of North Korea in the nuclear area, including its ballistic capacity, and probably in the chemical area as well, really does change the situation. The regional threat has now become a global threat, an immediate threat. Uh, let's not be under any illusions. This threat is unprecedented and has no equivalent. The North Korean regime, however, has up to date shown no intention to reverse course. By marching ahead with its nuclear and ballistic illicit 
programs, it continues to flout its international obligations and to defy this council, and that to the detriment of its own population. I would stress here that the dramatic situation for human rights in North Korea is getting worse, and we heard about this at the beginning of this week with regard to the humanitarian situation. It is the North Korean regime which is primarily responsible for this. Mr. President, in the light of this very dangerous and volatile situation, and this is my second point, our central line of action must be to stand firm. First of all, because the dangerous downward spiral that North Korea has engaged upon threatens the very foundations of our collective security system, and together we have the responsibility to preserve that. It is essential that we react to this testing of the non-proliferation regime and avoid any impunity which would necessarily lead others to call this into question. What is at stake here is our ability to ensure our own security, but also to stop the overturning of the strategic balance in Asia, and beyond that, the strategic stability, which is the foundation for peace and security. As part of this, our action should contain two areas. It is indispensable, first of all, to implement existing sanctions strictly and comprehensively in the face of the formidable inventiveness of the North Korean networks to circumnavigate and escape the effects of these decisions. Everyone knows the uneven implementation of sanctions seriously affects the effectiveness of our collective action. Their correct implementation is the responsibility of all member states, beginning with these seated on this Council. We must also react methodically and with determination to all North Korean provocations in order to prevent further escalation and to preserve the non-proliferation regime. If North Korea continues to uh, ignore our injunctions to defy them and not to uh, show reason, North Korea will leave us with no other choice than to stand firm and to strengthen sanctions. And let's understand that sanctions are not a goal in themselves. They target the regime for what it does and not for what it is. Mr. President, the third and final priority must be the potential for diplomacy to find a political solution. We do not and have never closed the door to dialogue. All of our efforts, on the contrary, are aimed at convincing Pyongyang to come back to the table of negotiations and to accept negotiations on its nuclear and ballistic program. But we are forced to state that given the stubbornness of North Korea, only maximum pressure today can enable us to come back to the path of negotiation. Mr. President, France, of course, is in favor of, of a resumption of talks, but it is up to the North Korean regime to give us clear indications that it is prepared to open discussions, and uh, the sooner the better. Mr. President, France's belief is that maximum pressure on the North Korean regime is our best lever to enable dialogue, which itself is the condition for a political solution. Otherwise, everything will be seen as a sign of weakness by North Korea, expressions of division between us. Um, they will be encouraged to continue their provocations and objectively that will uh, run the risk of things getting even worse and more extreme. So quite simply, uh, France would call the, on this Council to show firmness. That is our best antidote in the light of the risk of war, and it's our best chance to open up the path to dialogue and therefore to a political solution that we all seek. I thank you. I thank the representative of the France for his statement. I now give the floor to representative of Ethiopia. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. We thank the Japanese presidency for organizing this timely and important high-level session on the issue of the DPRK. And we are pleased to see you presiding, Mr. Minister. Our minister would have been 
here today if it had not been for the Igar Council of Ministers meeting and the high level revitalization forum, both due to take place over the coming days in Addis Ababa. We thank Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his briefing on the topic of our discussion today, which we understand was one of the issues raised during his visit to Tokyo. We share his views. No wonder, therefore, in this statement, we may have to repeat what the Secretary General has stressed. Mr. President, we can imagine the level of anxiety and deep concern in Japan concerning the repeated ballistic missile tests by the DPRK. We know most of those missiles fell into Japan's exclusive economic zone, and some of them flew over its territory. As the only country to ever suffer a nuclear attack, it's not difficult to realize how sensitive this issue is to the Japanese people and government. However, the nuclear and ballistic missile activities of the DPRK pose grave danger, not only to Japan and the Northeast region, Northeast Asia region. As a, as a matter of fact, there is no greater threat to global peace and security at the moment than the potential nuclear catastrophe that is hanging over the Korean Peninsula. It doesn't require to be an expert of the area to know that no war in the peninsula would be limited. The possibility of its widening must be taken for granted. That's why every possible diplomatic effort must be made to avert this dangerous situation, which could potentially have devastating consequences for the region and the world at large. Mr. President, at this stage, it has become all the more apparent that there is no other option than a peaceful and diplomatic path to resolving the crisis in the Korean Peninsula. In this regard, priority should be given to easing the heightened tensions and avoiding the risk of miscalculations, including by the reopening of communication channels, if so far there are none. We have no illusion that the DPRK issue can be resolved anytime soon, but it is absolutely important that all sides start taking even small but meaningful steps to build the necessary trust and confidence, which could help pave the way for the resumption of dialogue and negotiation to find a comprehensive and lasting solution to the DPRK issue and achieve the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This, everybody agrees, is the key to preserving the peace and security of Northeast Asia. We very much welcome the visit to the DPRK by Under Secretary General Jeffrey Feltman, the first such visit by a senior official of the United Nations since 2010. This is a small but important step in the right direction. And we very much appreciate the briefing that we received on the range of discussions he had with North Korean officials in Pyongyang which we found extremely useful. What this visit has shown is that the engagement of the United Nations, and particularly the Secretary General's good offices, could be helpful. Even though nothing concrete came out of the visit by Under Secretary General Feltman, we believe the various discussions he held might have contributed to a better understanding of the thinking in Pyongyang and to devising a strategy of engagement to bring the DPRK back to the negotiating table. That, in our view, is very critical. In the meantime, the full and effective implementation of the various Security Council resolutions by all member states remains very crucial. 
as the chair of the 1718 committee said in his annual report, and I quote, to create conditions to restarting negotiations while at the same time hindering the development of nuclear and ballistic missiles programs of the DPRK, end of quotation. This notwithstanding, we'd like to point out the need to pay attention to the humanitarian situation in the country. We hope the recent UN engagement with the DPRK government will contribute to improving the provision of life-saving humanitarian assistance to the population in need. This might also contribute to raising the level of mutual confidence, which is so much non-existent now. We welcome the presence at this meeting of the representative of the DPRK. Finally, Mr. President, it's only through the unity of the Council that we can avert the dangerous situation in the Korean Peninsula. And it's only appropriate that this critical, at this critical juncture to focus on what will contribute to the further enhancement of the cooperation among member, members of the Council to ensure the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We should not lose hope on the possibility of achieving that goal. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Ethiopia for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you very much, President. Your Excellency, Minister, we welcome you as President of this Security Council meeting. We thank the Secretary General of the United Nations for his briefing on the situation around the Korean Peninsula. There can be no doubt that currently we are living through one of the most acute and dramatic phases in the development of the situation on the Korean Peninsula. It is possible to say without exaggeration that peace in this region is subject to serious tests and the threat of the increase in or the transition in the confrontation to a, a hotspot is, is very great. Military rhetoric accompanied by a test of strength between the participants has led to a situation where around the world people have begun to wonder whether there will be war or not. As is known, in the conditions of such tension, one ill-thought-out or misinterpreted step could lead to lamentable consequences. Russia has observed with concern the development of the situation in the region, the dangerous development indeed. Of course, we are united in our condemnation of the provocatory nuclear missile activity of Pyongyang, which in the last 18 months has taken on a dangerous trend. The situation is unacceptable when the latest launch is made without any prior notification from North Korean territory subjecting the lives of citizens to risk, including those who are transiting through the air and sea in the region. We reject this activity by the DPRK, which, mean, which confirms our support for all of the UN sanction activity, which we are unswervingly implementing. We call on the North Korean authorities to wind down their banned programs and to return to the non-proliferation regime of the, of the NPT and also the IAEA as a non-nuclear state. At the same time, it should be clear to everybody that the DPRK is hardly going to refrain from its nuclear missile program while it feels a direct threat to its security. Indeed, this is how Pyongyang evaluates the regular wide-scale maneuvers and exercises by the United States and its allies in the region. President, on the international sanctions on DPRK, once again we would like to confirm our commitment to their implementation. Having said that, and we have emphasized this time and again, such measures should not be an end in themselves but rather an instrument for drawing the country into constructive negotiations on substantive issues. Diplomacy isn't just sanctions. Sanctions aren't diplomacy, as some partners are trying to convince us. At least, it's not diplomacy in the traditional sense. It is an extreme instrument of involving people when all other methods have been exhausted. There is a whole range of different other methods within the diplomatic arsenal. 
in all sanctions decisions of the Council, there are also there are also the requirement to fulfil a political component, which unfortunately many people have forgotten about, focusing instead only on restrictions. Resolving the nuclear issue is, po is not possible just through pressure on Pyongyang and through sanctions. Sanctions should not be used for, to stifle the country in economic terms or to improve the humanitarian situation. This is particularly the case to unilateral restrictions, which affect civilian sectors which aren't connected with the nuclear missile program of the country. These sanctions are the reason for a serious worsening in the conditions of the living conditions of the population. Furthermore, unilateral limits which circumvent or add what's being done through the Security Council undermine the effective implementation of the Security Council's decisions on the political settlement of the situation on the Korean Peninsula, not to mention the damage that's being done to the legal interests of third countries. And incidentally, I'd like to say to the distinguished Secretary of State that the North Korean workers aren't working in Russia in slave-like conditions. They're working on the basis of an intergovernmental agreement with the DPRK, which guarantees their rights. Incidentally, Secretary of State, since I'm already addressing you, we very much hope that, that there will be, that the US will be able to resolve the, or help to resolve the crisis in the Korean Peninsula. Mentioning the sanction regimes within the Security Council, we have to recognize that the humanitarian exemptions that were that identified under them aren't working. This has been said by the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs recently in a briefing to the Specialized Committee 1718 of the Security Council. The ban on correspondence with banks in DPRK has made it difficult not only to procure food and goods for the national economy from abroad, but also the financing of those UN agencies that are working within the country. President. Without question, DPRK's refusal to fulfill the corresponding Security Council resolutions is unacceptable. At the same time, we cannot allow any attempts to resolve these long-standing problems in the region just through military means. It's enough to look at the history of the Korean War to understand what that would mean. In the current conditions, we unswervingly call on all of the parties to not allow further escalation in tension which, would accompany, which accompanies each new cycle of reaction and counter-reaction. There is a need to review the policy of mutual pressure and intimidation. It won't bring us any results. We assume that there is a need for a comprehensive approach to resolving the situation. The denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is impossible without the general normalization of military political situation and refusing the increase in military infrastructure including the deployment in the region of elements of the U.S. global missile defense system and also without cuts in the scale of the maneuvers carried out and without finding the, the atmosphere of trust between the states in Northeast Asia. Unfortunately, recently we are seeing the reverse trend. Two and a half months of quiet from the point of Pyongyang were answered by Washington and its allies by unscheduled and unprecedented in their scale maneuvers and exercises in October and December and also by the introduction of unilateral sanctions and classifying the country among state sponsors of terrorism. All of these steps force us to wonder about the sincerity of statements that, that suggest that there is a preference for a peaceful approach to resolving the crisis in DPRK. Chairman. We call on the interested parties to quickly take practical steps to de-escalate the situation. In particular, it would be good to refrain from the planned latest military exercises. It goes without question that Pyongyang is also obliged to, cut, to finish its nuclear missile tests. It's, it's, we are ready for closer cooperation with all partners to aim to find a quick settlement of the issues on the Korean Peninsula through the only possible means, namely through political and diplomatic means and through a mutually respectful dialogue. This was the aim behind the Russian-Chinese roadmap to settlement. We call on all interested parties in the period of preparation and the holding of the Winter Olympics in South Korea, in, in South Korea to refrain from any kind of provocation or unconsidered initiatives and to use this time to find a place, a way to, through a political and diplomatic settlement. And in conclusion, Chairman, I would, like to, I would like to address Minister Klimkin, who spoke today here. I'd like to advise him when he speaks to the Security Council and in 
in his legends that he spoke about what happened in the Ukraine, that he might want to actually keep to the item on the agenda. Thank you. I thank the representative of Russian Federation for his statement. And I will give the floor to the representative of Kazakhstan. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I would like to thank the Secretary General Guterres for his informative report on this very serious matter. The situation around North Korea is an issue on which we all have a united position. First, we do not want the expansion of the nuclear club and will not accept any aspirations to acquire nuclear weapons by any state. Kazakhstan has been and remains an active supporter of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. This could be achieved through confidence building and finding a pragmatic compromise aimed at building a mutually safe and peaceful coexistence. Secondly, the DPRK's reckless actions to launch missiles and nuclear tests are recognized as the gravest violations of the Security Council resolutions. Kazakhstan has experienced all the devastating consequences of nuclear tests and therefore stands for their prohibition in the 21st century. Unfortunately, to this day, we are still not able to achieve the entry into force of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, which could make ending all of all tests a reality. We have to outlaw nuclear testing in the modern world. Thirdly, the DPRK should comply with the requirements of all security resolutions. Only a thorough and strict adherence to them can ease the sanctions regime imposed on Pyongyang. It is in the interest of the government of North Korea to engage in a substantive dialogue and resume the negotiation process to avoid irreversible negative consequences of its irresponsible behavior. In this respect, we recommend to capitalize on the recent contact between the UN Secretariat and the government of North Korea to expand the window of opportunity for peaceful cooperation and diplomacy. It is expedient to reduce the risk of conflict and further deterioration of the, different, uh, of the difficult humanitarian situation in light of cuts of funding, which can seriously affect the lives of ordinary citizens in the country. Mr. President, the current situation on the Korean Peninsula is indeed the most tense and dangerous than it has ever been before. We need to prevent all possible miscalculations and must strive to reduce the risk of escalating the conflict. All the sides should restrain from negative rhetorics and actions. We consider it is necessary to seek and create the prerequisites for continuing contacts initiated between the United Nations and Pyongyang. Today's meeting is the Security Council, in, uh, of the Security Council is a clear signal to North Korea that the nuclear path will not provide any guarantees for the security and well-being of its own people and of all others. Mr. President, the non-nuclear path of Kazakhstan can serve as a practical guide for DPRK and other countries striving to obtain nuclear capability. We have built and strengthened our independence and gained international respect by renouncing nuclear weapons. My president demonstrated a strong political will to read off its nuclear weapons and tests in a very challenging environment at the time of radical transformation of the world order. And as the time showed, it was the right decision. And I thank you, State Secretary uh, Rex Tillerson, for mentioning it at the last debate on DPRK in this very chamber. We therefore call on the leadership of North Korea to renounce its nuclear weapons for the benefit of all. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Kazakhstan for his statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of Uruguay. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd like to begin by thanking you, Minister, for presiding over our work today, as well as the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, for his comprehensive briefing. We share the concern of the Japanese present presidency of the Security Council, and we think it's very uh, opportune that the me meeting has been organized today. This is particularly important at a time when the situation on the North Korean peninsula represents the greatest threat to international peace and security. The proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, be they nuclear, 
chemical or biological weapons constitute a real and serious threat to international peace and security. These weapons must not be used by anyone and not under any circumstances. Uruguay insists on recalling that when it comes to disarmament and non-proliferation, it is the duty of all states to strictly respect their commitments in accordance with international law, such as the uh, NPT and the provisions of the United Nations Charter. On numerous occasions, Uruguay has expressed its fervent condemnation of nuclear tests and the launching of ballistic missiles carried out by North Korea. We will continue to do so if this country continues with its threatening behavior and if it continues to violate resolutions of the Security Council. Uruguay once again calls upon North Korea to abandon its nuclear program complete, in a complete, verifiable, and irreversible manner, immediately ceasing all related activities, including the launch, launching of ballistic missiles with ballistic technology. We urge them to return to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the safeguards regime of the IAEA. Mr. President, the sanctions imposed have attempted to be the means to bring the North Korean government to the negotiating table. However, and despite all of the calls that have been issued by the international community to begin a dialogue, to date it has not been possible to open up the door to negotiation, but it is, is this that is indispensable to de-escalate the situation. The sanctions imposed on North Korea must be implemented completely and effectively uh, by all member states. At the same time, these must not have adverse effects on the population. This is why, Mr. President, we are concerned at uh, information received that sanctions could be having negative effects, non-intentional negative effects on the humanitarian situation in the country. And that's why we feel it would be appropriate to conduct a cautious analysis of them. Throughout our participation as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, Uruguay has supported all actions taken by this organ with regard to North Korea. We have also always stated a position on this issue which supports all of those initiatives aimed at dialogue. There is no military solution to the problem in North Korea. The solution for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula has to be a peaceful one achieved through negotiations, diplomatic negotiations, and which leads to a political agreement between the parties. It is towards this end that we must work without delay before it is too late and before we are forced to lament a disaster of devastating proportions. We particularly appreciate the recent visit of the USG for Political Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Feltman, to North Korea which is a specific step in the right direction after a, an extremely prolonged hiatus. It is crucial, therefore, to keep these channels of communication open between the United Nations and the government of North Korea. This will make it possible to create the appropriate conditions for a resumption of negotiations. In order to do this, Mr. President, it will also be necessary to address the interests and the legitimate concerns of all parties to the issue. Therefore, efforts aimed at generating trust between the parties should be increased. As members of the United Nations, there is no alternative to dialogue. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Uruguay for his statement. And I'll give the floor to the representative of Senegal. Thank you very much, President. Senegal thanks Japan for having organized this open debate, and we're very pleased to see the minister presiding over this debate on the issue of non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We also thank Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the United Nations, for his statement, which has contributed to enriching our debate. President, here we are yet again in this forum to discuss non-proliferation in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. 
each time my country, Senegal, has restated its firm condemnation for the number of acts of defiance that this country has perpetrated against the international community and against the Security Council in particular, in particular through its 17 launches of ballistic missiles, two of which are intercontinental, and also a sixth nuclear test in December. The North Korean authorities presented this as a test of a hydrogen bomb of a yield that has been unprecedented. This is a game changer because with this new intercontinental ballistic missile launch of the 28th of November, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, having methodically continued its program for nuclear weapons and for missiles, has shown more than ever its determination to acquire, if it hasn't already, military nuclear capacity. Senegal sees this as a grave threat to the non-proliferation regime which could exacerbate the tensions that are already very high on the peninsula and also beyond. It also represents a serious threat not only for the population of the peninsula and the region but also security of air transport in this part of the world which is heavily populated and also sees a lot of dense air traffic. In this context, the Security Council has a serious challenge because despite all of the resolutions and sanctions and other measures that this body has taken, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, far from abandoning its nuclear ambitions, has gone as far as challenging the very competence of this council to examine the issue presented by its military program. We recently adopted resolutions 2371 and 2375, but that's not changed anything. Therefore, the question arises, what more do we have to do to encourage this country to respect its international commitments in this area in a clear, verifiable and irreversible fashion? To attempt to answer that question, my country, taking account of the fact that there cannot be a military solution to the crisis, which is what we all believe, has called for a holistic, peaceful and negotiated solution through an open and loyal dialogue. It also encourages the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to resume the place that it unfortunately chose to leave when negotiations, the six-party negotiations, were taking place. Senegal has also insistently called on the DPRK to respect its international commitments while stressing that targeted measures that have been taken with good reason within the most recent Security Council resolution on DPRK to respond to the challenge presented by the nuclear program and ballistic missile program, that those measures should be part of a holistic political strategy to encourage the parties to open dialogue for denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and to do this with the active support of the international community, thereby creating the conditions for peaceful coexistence between the countries and peoples of the region. In other words, the member states should redouble their efforts and should fully meet their commitments made in different resolutions because the lack of genuine political will and also the lack of capacity among member states can only facilitate the proliferation of WMDs. Senegal is of the view that we should work to strengthen the authority of the Non-Proliferation Treaty by making it universal and also by respecting other commitments previously made. We remain convinced that the universalization of the NPT and the application of its relevant provisions, as well as resolute action to ensure the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, represent decisive milestones towards general and complete disarmament. I thank you. I thank the representative of Senegal for his statement. I now give the floor to Representative of Italy. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Mr. President, allow me at the outset to thank you and to thank the Japanese Presidency for convening this important meeting as well as the Secretary General for his briefing. We appreciate also USG Jeff Feldman's visit to Pyongyang last week and support the United Nations efforts to establish a channel of communication with the North Korean authorities, also in order to reduce the risk of unintentional escalation. Mr. President, there can be no ambiguity in our analysis of the current scenario. The deterioration registered over the past year is a direct consequence of the North Korean regime illegal and destabilizing activities. This threat is immediate and global in scope. We extend once again our full solidarity with the citizens of Japan and South Korea. And we cannot forget the plight of the people of North Korea, while the government diverts energies and resources towards the development of illegal weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> Mr. President, we have repeatedly seen how the DPRK's regime unprecedented provocations in the development of nuclear arms and missile capabilities have flared up tensions in the Korean Peninsula and beyond constituting, in our, in our view, one of the gravest threats to international peace and security we are facing today. We strongly condemn these activities and call on North Korea to abide to its international obligations. We also call, call on the DPRK to abandon its chemical weapons program and immediately adhere to the Chemical Weapons Conven Convention as called for in Resolution 2371. Mr. President, it is clear that the conflict in the Korean Peninsula would be catastrophic for the region and for the world. This Council responds, therefore, to the situation in the DPRK this year has been forceful and effective. Three new resolutions have been approved, providing for the most comprehensive set of sanctions in a generation. We have also taken significant additional measures at the European Union and national levels. Italy recently interrupted the accreditation procedure for the designated DPRK ambassador to Rome. The sanctions are meant to achieve three main goals. First, to make North Korean real regime realize that further provocation will only lead to greater isolation. Second, to stop the DPRK from exploiting the interconnected nature of the global economy in order to fund its illegal weapons program. Third, to provide the necessary leverage in order to bring about a verifiable change in the regime policies, therefore opening the way towards a political solution based on complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. And I wish to emphasize that this strategy will fully work only if two conditions are met. First, full and comprehensive implementation of the sanctions by the whole UN membership. And second, continued unity in the Council on this issue. As chair of the 1718 Sanctions Committee, Italy has worked to improve the implementation of sanctions throughout this year. But many challenges remain. Such an articulated and wide sanction regime requires constant, constant interaction with member states to bridge information gaps. Furthermore, many countries face capaci capacity challenges. There is also an issue related to timing, the delay in transposing sanctions provisions into national legislation may create opportunities for evading them. This is also why it is crucial to submit national implementation reports on time. While we have seen a steady increase over the last year, there is room for improvement. Let me underline the importance and urgency of submitting implementation reports by all member states for all DPRK sanctions resolutions. Lastly, Mr. President, I wish to reiterate that sanctions are not meant to have unintended negative consequences on the humanitarian situation in the country. 
which continues to be a matter of serious concern while bearing in mind that it is the DPRK regime which bears primary responsibility for improving the livelihood of its people. We continue to engage with all relevant stakeholders on this issue, and I chaired last week a Productive Sanctions Committee meeting on the humanitarian situation. In this context, we renew our appeal to humanitarian actors to make full use of the relevant existing exemption provided for in the various Security Council resolutions. And at the same time, we believe that a more timely and systematic interaction between the UN agencies and the committee, the 1718 committee, could go a long way in preventing unnecessary obstacles in providing critical humanitarian assistance to the North Korean people. And I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Italy for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the plurinational state of Bolivia. Thank you very much, Minister. We would like to begin by uh, welcoming you here, Minister, today to the Security Council to preside over our work. We would also like to thank the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, for his briefing. Bolivia, as a pacifist country, promotes the dialogue, uh, the culture of dialogue and the right to peace and cooperation between peoples with full right to their sovereignty and diplomacy between their peoples. In this respect, our constitution prohibits the manufacture and use of chemical, biological or nuclear weapons on Bolivian territory. As part of the first zone that is densely populated in the world that declared itself free of nuclear weapons through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Such Weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean, known as the Treaty of Tlatelolco, and as the first region to declare itself a zone of peace, we urge that this example be replicated in other areas of the world. Mr. President, in this regard, Bolivia expresses its most firm and energetic condemnation of the launching of ballistic missiles as well as the nuclear tests carried out by the DPRK. And we would call upon this country to abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile program in a complete, verifiable and irreversible manner and comply with the provisions of the Security Council resolutions and return to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. We would point out here the importance of adherence to the United Nations Charter, according to which the Security Council is the only legal body that can take the measures necessary in order to maintain or re-establish international peace and security. In this way, ruling out any unilateral action. This is why we reject any act of provocation or implication of unilateral sanctions, because these not only constitute a flagrant violation of international law, but also because they undermine the efforts and the work of multilateral organizations such as our own. Because they extend the jurisdiction and internal legislation of one state to another, violating the principles of equality, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of states. This is why we would urge all parties involved to avoid increasing tensions and an escalation of rhetoric, and we would call for an end to this spiral of confrontation and threats of the use of armed force. It must be understood that there can be no military solution to the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Mr. President, the sanctions imposed in resolutions adopted by this Council should not be an end in themselves. They should serve as an opportunity to bring the parties to the negotiating table in order to resume dialogue and achieve a peaceful dip diplomatic and political solution, the aim of which will be the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So far this year, the Security Council has approved three resolutions, increasingly harsh, which, depending on their degree of implementation, are also affecting the civilian population with possible humanitarian consequences. We believe that, as it is clearly stated in these very resolutions, it is not only necessary to work to implement these sanctions, but also to approach dialogue, come round to dialogue, and to resume the six-party talks. This is essential. 
Here we reiterate our support for the Chinese initiative of suspension for suspension, which make, would make it possible to have a simultaneous suspension on the Korean peninsula. On the one hand, the DPRK would stop its nuclear and ballistic tests immediately, and on the other hand, all kinds of unilateral or joint exercises in the region should be also ceased. And here we would reiterate our support for the Russian-Chinese proposal and roadmap, which to date is the only concrete proposal that has been presented to resolve the situation. Along these lines, the efforts undertaken to re-establish mechanisms for dialogue of uh, those measures, we would highlight the recent visit to DPRK of USG Mr. Jeffrey Feltman. To, to the country, and we hope that these channels of communication uh, that were able to be established will remain open in order to uh, initiate a dialogue without preconditions and to build mutual trust. Finally, Mr. President, my delegation would like to state that today we are meeting at a time of great tension globally. But with regard to the situation on the North Korean Peninsula, on the Korean Peninsula, we feel it's important to begin dialogue that will give rise to stability in the region and achieve just and lasting peace. I thank you. I thank the representative of the plurinational state of Bolivia for his statement. The representative of Ukraine has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Um, thanks, Mr. President. I wanted to use my right uh, to react uh, to what the Russian representative uh, has just said. One point uh, about the proper format uh, addressing different issues. Basically, it was about uh, Russia breaking the Budapest Memorandum and all kind of uh, legal written and unwritten uh, commitments in the sense of creating the atmosphere of impunity, which contributed to the situation where we are now. And uh, if, uh, you know, the moment uh, I were listening to your presentation, uh, Mr. President, uh, and the narrative about the DPRK, it's basically about breaking international law, sanctions and hostages. It's actually the same uh, narrative what, what we have on Russia, you know, breaking international law, sanctions, hostages. So we have one big rock stake, you know, one smaller rock stake, and uh, the difference is actually only, only in scale. But, you know, uh, uh, but I wanted also to react to one point, which is, uh, for me, twisted, irresponsible, and mind-blowing logic. The Russian representative has said that basically North Korean nuclear and missile program in a way in answer on the trainings around the North Korea. Russia were having uh, military drillings, the most, uh, you know, fundamental in scale this year in Belarus, trying to screw everybody up about uh, their goals and, uh, and scale. So following uh, Russian logic, I should now call for, uh, for my country to become, uh, you know, nuclear and to develop a missile program. In a way, uh, it's uh, actually the whole irresponsible logic which could uh, trigger a nuclear race in the whole uh, world tomorrow. So uh, I believe we have to stop trying to find uh, any kind of excuses for any kind of wrong behavior. It, it's my fundamental point. And I wanted to use uh, this opportunity simply to make this point again. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Klimkin for his statement. The representative of Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give him the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much, President. I'll be very brief. I'm not going to get into a discussion of the substance of what the Ukrainian delegate has said. I'm, I'm pleased to see that there are many different nations in the room today because they have the opportunity to see the lack of respect for the Ukrainian delegation to the UN, to the UN Security Council and the other member states. I thank you very much. 
I thank the representative of Russian Federation for his statement and now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Cho Hyun, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Republic of Korea. Mr. President, thank you very much for convening this meeting and the opportunity to speak to the Council. I also thank the Secretary General for his briefing. Let me start by rewinding the clock to December 2016. The Council had adopted resolutions 2270 and 2321 in response to North Korea's fourth and fifth nu nuclear tests with the hope that this would change the behavior of North Korea. However, fast forwarding to December 2017, the situations have further deteriorated. North Korea conducted yet another nuclear test and launched 20 ballistic missiles this year. To be fair, the international community responded by further strengthening and implementing the Security Council resolutions while not losing sight of the efforts to resume dialogues. These endeavors, however, have not been enough to bring North Korea back to the negotiation table for denuclearization. Mr. President, just over a couple of weeks ago, North Korea launched its most advanced ballistic missile with intercontinental range. North Korea claimed afterwards to have achieved the completion of its state nuclear force. Amid diverging assessment, what is certain is that North Korea is indeed in the final stages of nuclear weaponization. If completed, it will fundamentally alter the security landscape in the region and beyond. Many commentators point out that it will aggravate tension in the already heavily militarized region and even worry about the risk of nuclear proliferation to rogue states and non-state actors. North Korea also threatens to shatter the foundation of international non-proliferation regimes and continues to inflict lasting harm on its own people. The international community, now more so than ever, must grasp the gravity and urgency of the North Korean threat and find ways to halt its nuclear program and bring it back to the path of denuclearization. Mr. President, what matters more now is not a mere assessment of the North Korean threat, but rather our united will and firm action against this regime. North Korea is fiercely waging a battle of wills against the international community. It wants to be recognized as a nuclear weapon state on its own terms and conditions. Our answer should be absolutely no. We should not be coerced by North Korea's continuing provocations, but rather uphold our principles while firmly responding to its reckless behaviors. At the same time, we should not be provoked into conflict, nor should we shut the doors of dialogue and peace. Our common goal is the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea in a peaceful manner. In this context, I would like to underscore that 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games should be an Olympic for peace. 
My government urges North Korea to join the Olympic Games and to seize this opportunity for dialogues. North Korea is also waging a battle of actions against the international community. Time and again, North Korea has found and taken advantage of the loopholes in the Council resolutions. North Korea has preyed on the weak links of the international community. The sanctions are not an end in themselves and are not meant to bring down North Korea, but to bring it to the negotiating, negotiation table for denuclearization. However, we are to bring the unwilling North Korea back to the table. We must fill in all gaps identified in the implementation of the res resolutions. In this regard, we deeply appreciate the active efforts of the 1718 Committee. The international community has made some progress, including the restriction on oil supply, the export ban on North Korea's key products, and the prohibition of overseas work authorization. Many countries, even those with long-standing relationship with North Korea, have joined these efforts, including through the expulsion of individuals on the sanctions list. The record high number of submissions of international uh, implementation of reports for resolutions 2270 and 2321 is a testimony to the enhanced awareness of the international community regarding the North Korean threat. However, in our race against North Korea, we need to do more, way more. North Korea's evasive tactics are becoming more sophisticated and this regime continues to exploit all weak links. In fact, the Republic of Korea has been actively cooperating with its partners to identify and stop North Korea's attempts to evade sanctions and seek alternative goods to sell coals and other banned products and to illegally import oil. Let me emphasize that none of us should become that weak link and that none of us should condone groups and individuals who assist North Korea's defiance against this council. In this regard, sharing best practices against North Korea's evasive tactics would be helpful in closing the loopholes. Mr. President, I began my remarks by recalling how we ended the year 2016 and how North Korea defiantly continued its series of provocations in 2017. We cannot afford to sit again at the end of 2018 and feel as if it were a deja vu of 2017, regretting our business as usual approach. The council members and the international community must redouble their efforts to ensure a seamless and complete implementation of the sanctions and apply as much pressure as necessary until North Korea returns to the negotiation table with a sincere willingness for denuclearization. With a sense of urgency, we should make North Korea perceive without a doubt that it will pay heavily for its provocations, that it will never be accepted as a nuclear weapon state, and that dialogue for denuclearization is the only viable option. The Republic of Korea reaffirms its solid commitment to achieve the denuclearization of North Korea and the establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. We will work closely with all countries 
to this end. Thank you. His Excellency Mr. Cho for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the Democratic People's Republic of <clears throat> Korea. Mr. President, at the outset, I condemn Japan in my strongest possible terms, who is holding presidency of the UN Security Council during December this year and uh, instigated by the United States is, uh, now, is now making as able use of its opportunity by convening the ministerial briefings of the UN Security Council on non-proliferation issue of the DPRK. I have to mention about that the meeting today is none other than a separate measures plotted by the US, by the US being terrified by the inc incredible might of our republic that has successfully achieved the great historic cause of completing the state nuclear force cause of building up a of a rocket power through a great November event. I believe that if non-proliferation issue is to be discussed, the first countries to be brought before the Court of Justice at the U.S., who is the kingpin of virtual and uh, horizontal proliferation, hoping as almost of funds into the modernization of nuclear weapons and hindering in every way the denuclearization of the Middle East and Japan, who keeps more than this necessary stockpile of plutonium and seeks every opportunity to produce nuclear weapons. Our procession of nuclear weapons was an individual step self-defensive measures of defend our sovereignty and the rights of existence and development from the U.S., from the U.S., nuclear threat and blackmail, and it anyone is to blame for it. The, the U.S. is the one who must be held accountable. There are several nuclear power states over the world now, but there is no country like the U.S. who is continuing to openly treat and blackmail other countries with its nuclear weapons. We could easily draw to the answer of this case only being noted now much amount of money of the, of the, of money of the years is running through for the maintenance and the modernization of its nuclear weapons. It is already well known to the outside that the U.S. has now stockpiled more than 4,000 nuclear warheads in its nuclear arsenals, deploying over 115 technical nuclear bombs over the territory of each NATO allies, and is now planning to consume up around 1 trillion U.S. dollars for its nuclear weapons. Uh, maintenance and modernization during 30 years in future. All of the figures above clearly over prove that the, that the U.S. is only the right need in nuclear proliferation. It is also disturbing to see the U.N. Security Council acting like <coughs> a tool of the U.S. and playing to each turn instead of keeping impartiality as the lifeline in its activities through to each mission to pressure international peace and security. It is the UN Security Council of today that while ignoring our re repeated request to bring the issue of the provocated and aggressive joint military exercise on the table of the Council, the most graphic Manifestation of nuclear threat and the blackmail of the U.S. keeps itself uh, busy, knowing time to the U.S. that assess the sanctions and the pressure against us by condemning our self-defense defensive measures. The DPRK, at every time when the U.S. South Korean joint military exercise that three 
threatening serious the peace and the security of the South Korean Peninsula is a region and the world war world are waged submitted the letters to the Security Council for 11 times from the year 2015 requesting to raise the issue and discuss it emergently at the Council. However, on the contrary, turning away its face at every time of our request for such aggressive joint military exercise to the last, the UN Security Council has adopted 11 sanction resolutions against my country, denouncing our self-defensive measures as a, as of a threat to interna international peace and security. With only above mentioned fact, we could easily prove unfairness, double standard, and party prejudice of the Secu Security Council. As we have clarified in the government statement, the development and advancement of the strategic weapons of the DPRK are entirely to defend the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of the country from the, from the U.S. nuclear blackmail policy and the nuclear threat and to ensure the peaceful life of the people and therefore we would not pose any threat to any country and the region as long as the interests of the DPRK are not inviting upon. Reiterating once again, our nuclear force is served through thoroughly for each mission as self-defensive deterrent and it is fully accord to the Rule 51 of the UN Charter stipulating the right the right of existence exercise of self-defense measures to be made by individual UN member states. The DPRK is in accordance with the degree of the Supreme People's Assembly adopted on 1 April 2013, has established the abolished perfect system and order of stockpiling and maintaining the fully guarantee any kind of illegal transfer of nuclear weapons, its technology and weapon grade nuclear material. As of the result, there is no single case being raised about our nuclear proliferation up to the moment. All of the data of impurity related with my country's proliferation uh, scattered by hostile forces are totally friendless plot intending to defend the dignity of the DPRK, the powerful nuclear state, and nothing but the only violation behavior of intensive by picking up the issue of strengthening of our national defensive measures. Position of the nuclear by the DPRK could not be the violation of any international law and uh, regulation in any case for the DPRK has withdrawn from the NPT in a most justified way. At the same time, it is clear to everybody that the DPRK does not inform any interest of other countries and the purpose of a procession of a nuclear deterrent is only for self-defensive and to safeguard the peace of the region. The DPRK, <coughs> whatever what says, will march forward and make great advancement victoriously as world most powerful nuclear any military state upholding the line on simultaneously development of the two fronts. In accordance hereby, I reform once again that the DPRK as a responsible nuclear power and a peace-loving state will sincerely fulfill its non proliferation obligation <coughs> assumed before the international society and put its every effort to achieve the noble cause of safeguarding world peace and security. Thank you.
I thank the representative of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea for his statement. The representative of the United States has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Rex Tillerson. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to respond to the statements of the DPRK permanent representative. First, I think we have heard all of these things before from this government. There is no doubt that the DPRK's pursuit of, nu of a nuclear arsenal is in clear violation of international law, directly challenges the global nonproliferation regime, and greatly threatens international peace and security. This body has unanimously made these points for well over a decade now. The international community condemns North Korea's pursuit of a nuclear arsenal, and we will never accept a nuclear North Korea. The DPRK's unlawful acts cannot be ignored, nor can they be explained away. The DPRK must be held accountable for its actions. And in that regard, any notion that the source of tensions on the peninsula are the fault of no one party, there is but one party that has carried out illegal detonation of nuclear devices. There is but one party that continues to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles in violation of UN Security Council resolutions, overflying another sovereign nation, Japan, threatening civil aviation security because these launches are undertaken with no notification. There is but one party that has been targeted with punishment and penalties through the most vigorous regime sanction ever enacted, and that is the Kim regime in North Korea. They alone are responsible for these tensions. They alone must take responsibility for these tensions, and they alone can solve these tensions. I thank His Ex Excellency Mr. Tillerson for his statement. Yes, I shall now make concluding remarks in my capacity as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Japan has consistently devoted itself to create a free and democratic country, respecting human rights and abiding by the rule of law, and to support peace and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific region as a peace-loving nation. The path Japan has walked as a peace-loving nation will not change in future and contribute to the peace and prosperity of the world more than ever before. In our meeting today, we have condemned in the strongest terms the acts of provocation by North Korea in violation of relevant Security Council resolutions. We once again made it clear that the international community will never accept a nuclear-armed North Korea. I call on all the member states to fully implement the relevant Security Council resolutions and maximize international pressure on North Korea in order to realize a denuclearized Korean Peninsula. After our presidency this month, Japan will leave the Security Council. However, we will continue to cooperate closely with the remaining and incoming members, as well as non-Security Council members, so that the North Korean issue will be properly addressed in the Council. I resume my function as a president of the council. The representative of Republic of Korea has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Chu Hyun. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I am compelled to reply to North Korea's truly regrettable arguments. As shown in the multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions, the international community has repeatedly made it clear that it will not recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapons state in any case. North Korea must stop provoca provocations and sincerely return to dialogue for denuclearization. Hopefully, North Korea will recognize that this is the only path 
to a secure and stable future. Thank you. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.